Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, again, my name is Petrania Poonswan, and I work here in Seattle. I'm a reporter at Cairo 7 News, and I actually got to know Catherine Lewis uh, quite a few years ago when we both worked in Washington, D.C., and that's how we became friends. And um, when she came out with this book, it was very exciting, and she asked if I wanted to take part in this event here today. So very happy, of course, to, to share the success and, of her book with you guys here today. So I just want to, um, before we introduce uh, Catherine, are you guys, who are parents here in this room? Lots of parents, grandparents, parents, grandparents. And uh, so it's a good idea of why people are here. Obviously, this is a very interesting topic and um, when it comes to disciplining children. Whose children are under the age of five? Under five, under 10, under 15? All right, interesting, just to get a sense of who we're talking about here. And, and Catherine is also a mother, and you have three children, hence the reason why you got interested in this in the first place. So again, the book is called The Good News About Bad Behavior. So there's good and bad both in the title, so that's really interesting, but there's good news in all of this, right? So oh, yeah. Catherine, so tell us a little bit about how this book even came about. So really, the book started with my own search for the answer to the question, why don't my kids do what I want? Yeah, you know? and I'm sure most parents can relate. <clears throat> yeah, and it sort of started as a little tickle in the back of my head and got more and more insistent mm -hmm. the older they got. So, and this um, is about how old were they when you start thinking about this? Well, my youngest was three and a half. Okay. You may have heard of the three-nager yeah. or the terrible threes. Yep. And so I started taking parenting classes and reading books. And then when my um, middle child started kindergarten, I volunteered at the school and was assigned playground duty. So I was out there in charge of keeping the kids safe and behaving themselves. And I was watching my perfect baby kindergartner with the round face and the chubby legs. And nearby there were some fourth and fifth grade boys playing really wildly with these kickballs and basketballs going all across the court. So I you know, thought, okay, here's my moment. I, I'm supposed to be in charge of keeping kids safe. And I said, boys, could you please play a little more gently so you don't hit the kindergartners? So anyone want to guess what they said? Did they say, thank you, Mrs. Lewis, for showing us the error of our ways? No, no, they did not. They did not say that. They ignored me. And so I walked up closer. I made eye contact. I used my big girl voice. Boys, you're playing too rough. You might hit the little kids. Stop. And again, just like I was a ghost. They couldn't see me. And that's when, as a journalist, I started to get really interested because when I was growing up, n nobody, maybe one or two hoodlums in the elementary school would have behaved like that, but the majority of kids would have pretended to do what I said. And then as I volunteered as a Girl Scout leader and an Odyssey of the Mind coach, in all these settings, I was hearing, oh, he has ADHD, she has anxiety, that's why they're having trouble sitting still or they need to ask you every five minutes so when's the period ending? So that's when I started looking at the research. And so basically what, it com what you found as a journalist and as a parent, you said that there is a trend in terms of um, the kind of issues that you know, kids are, are dealing with that have caused them to, to be kind of out of control in a right. way, right? right? And not really listening and not really um, you know, just following the rules, or, or, or being a good behavior. Right. I, mean that, I mean, you're talking about bad behavior. So what are some of the things that you found through your research that have led up to this? So, um, so the, the, I started looking at this question of, are kids different? Because it felt like it was different, and I wanted to know. So um, I have a couple of visual aids. Um, this is the central question of my book. This is one of my own children who is probably showing me the answer to a question like, could you please smile for the camera? And the answer was no, apparently. And this was the article that Amanda mentioned about that was in Mother Jones Magazine that just went viral. And this is what showed me that I had struck a chord, that I wasn't the only one having trouble getting kids to say yes. And then when I found this study at the National Institutes of Mental Health, 
it's, uh, that really convinced me that there is a crisis. So one in two children, according to this study of more than 10,000 young people, will have a mood or behavioral disorder or a substance addiction by the time they're 18 years old. And this is across the country. This is a representative sample of teenagers, but it refers back to some of these kids developed uh, one of these di disorders by like three or four or five. And so you can see 32% of teenagers will have an anxiety dis disorder and 19% will have a behavioral disorder. And it just goes from there. So all of these issues to me are problems with self-regulation. So either you're having trouble managing your behavior or your mood or your emotions or your thoughts. And if we can strengthen kids' ability to regulate those things, then we can help them to be very successful even while they may have some diagnosis. And I'm sure you, you say you followed a number of families to see. And, and did you see differences between families or how parents were reacting? Were they treating kids differently that they, or were they just all different families but kids are turning out the same way? Yeah, so there is such a range of kids and, and families, but I do find that for many of us, when we see a kid acting out, we instinctively reach for one of two tools, the carrot or the stick. So it's the reward for doing what I want or the punishment for doing what I didn't want you to do. And in my reporting, I mean, I spent five years following educators, psychologists, and families. My kids say I stalked families and little kids to really understand what was going on. And the conclusion I came to is that neither punishment nor rewards really works. In the, and by works, I mean leads to mentally healthy, capable, successful adults who have a good relationship with their parents. And instead, I found a different model, which is in the book I call the apprenticeship model. And I looked at four really powerful examples of this, two in schools and two in homes, where instead of thinking about the adult being in charge and wanting to force the child to do something or get the kid to cooperate, you instead have a dynamic where everyone's working together to get the things done that need to happen. And it sounds like it's, and when we were talking about this earlier, it's more, you said, teaching and not telling. And that's kind of the, the process that you want to start with your kids as early as possible, right? right? Right, If you think of your role as helping the child to learn to manage their behavior, instead of your role is making sure they're perfect or they're always doing the right thing or always behaving, I mean, that is impossible. And you're just setting yourself up for failure. If instead you say, oh, my job is when they hit a bump in the road, I am there to help them troubleshoot or reflect on what choices they made and how that might have led to the outcomes. We're really guides, right? We're not, as adults, we're not in charge of them. We're, we're just really supposed to be mentors and help them in that apprentice role. And uh, talk to me about some examples. I mean, who's the parents in here with kids maybe a little bit older or maybe even younger now who are on their cell phones or computers all the time, like who have kids who deal with that? And I think, you know, like, use that as an example for, you know, people, kids who just won't get off their computers or their phones. How would you use this model and be able to kind of relate to them and get them to understand that they need to do something outside of playing computers all day? Yes, this is, this is one of the most common questions I get from parents. And um, the models that I looked at in the book all share three common elements They that I um, started with a C to make it easier to remember, so they're alliterative. Number one is communication between the adult and the child. Number two is a connection between the adult and the child that really is the foundation for discipline. And number three is capability building. So a focus, again, on building that child's skills, their ability to deal with a situation, to manage their emotions, control their impulses, as opposed to you know, uh, thinking of them as bad or good. And in the case of screens, so that might look like you talk to your kids about how you want them to enjoy their Fortnite, right? or their Snapchat, or connect with their friends, or whatever they're doing online. And you also want them to do 
healthy exercise and have family time and, and all the other wonderful things in life. So how do we as a family have a balance? And you have a discussion, you agree to whatever limits seem reasonable, and then you try it out for a week or two. And in that discussion, you also lay out consequences if the agreement is not followed. And then for that time period, you just see how it goes. And some kids will fail. They will mess up, they will violate the agreement, and then you just implement the consequences that everyone's agreed to. Um, in the smaller scale, another thing that's really effective with screens is to just stand and ask for the screen if it's a time when your family doesn't use screens, like dinner or bedtime, and standing there and waiting when the child knows they're supposed to turn it over, it's uncomfortable, right? They will be drawn to cooperate much more than if you start yelling at them or nagging at them, because then they are in an oppositional relationship and they just get, want, get their back up, they just want to defy you. So some of the tools that we have as parents, we don't even know we have. We think, oh, my kid doesn't listen to me. But actually, our kids love us. They adore us. They want to be close to us. And so if we let them, they will. So they have a deep desire to please us, even though they may not always show it. And so if we give them that path and use that unspoken pressure, um, it's much more effective than the kind of explicit yelling or demanding or nagging. And I think you were talking about three different things that kids aren't doing enough of or what they're dealing with. And one of them is not being out there enough and getting. So talk about these three things that you've seen a pattern of across the country with children. Yeah, so as soon as I had this, you know, evidence that there is a self-regulation crisis, um, the, the next thing I wanted to ask is why? Well, before I got to why, I actually also asked myself, is this real? Or maybe we're just better at diagnosing. Maybe we're just more aware that kids have anxiety or depression or whatever. And I looked at some of the most hard and fast data you can with children, which is suicide data from the CDC. And they found that in the last decade, the suicide rate for tweens or young people between 10 and 14 years old has doubled in 10 years. Has that years. gotten younger than what you've seen? Yeah, or, it's yeah. The, so suicides are getting younger and younger. The, 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 it's growing faster at younger ages. And for teenagers 15 to 19, the suicide rate has gone up 41% in that time. So this to me was, okay, this is real. You can't argue with, I'm sorry to say, but dead children. And this is what tells me that we have to turn this around. Our children need better tools than they have. So um, I'm trying to remember what, Oh, so, so what helps kids self-regulate? So this is what I was talking about, this sort of connection relationship as the first element. But um, before we get there, I wanted to talk about, um, I can't leave it on the suicide rate slide, it's just too depressing. <laughs> so I'll just leave this slide up. Um, so why is this happening? I looked at some of the research behind what causes anxiety, depression, narcissism, and I came up with three big factors that are, have changed in our society in the last 30 years that also are connected with anxiety, depression, narcissism, attention problems, and those are number one, the disappearance of childhood play, number two, the growth of media, technology, and um, mass media as well as social media. And number three is that children are nowadays unemployed. They don't have a role in the home where they have a job, helping with dinner, watching a younger sibling, contributing to the neighborhood or helping a neighbor, even with an after-school job. Instead, the things we ask them to do are very, very demanding, right? Academics, um, sports, music, art. They're very busy with these intense pursuits that are all about them. So their identity is tied up in their individual accomplishments as opposed to the way that they can belong in a family or contribute to a community through simple chores or jobs or, or you know, tasks that, that they can accomplish and immediately see the impact. And it's not that it's bad to want our children to excel, but they need a balance of doing things for themselves that are achievement oriented and things where they're contributing to the benefit of their family. And that is work where they actually learn how to cook an egg or how to change a tire. And, and those are skills that no one can take from them. And I saw in the book here, and if you get the book, um, at, the, at the end of it, you actually list uh, age-appropriate 
jobs or chores that kids can do. And so these are kind of the guidelines that you can offer in this book for parents of all ages, right? To kind of get them into that mode of, of getting their kids involved in things that are more outside of themselves, I guess. Yeah, and yeah. summer is a great opportunity. As we move into summer, it's, there's less structure, there's more time. So it's a great time to say to your kids, hey, is there something around the house you have wanted to learn how to do? Would you like me to teach you how to cook your favorite meal or how to change a tire on the bike or some practical skill that they probably would love? My 11-year-old loves to garden, right? So she'll go out there and pull weeds, you know, because she thinks it's fun. So start with a chore that the child is interested in. And you'll be surprised at how good it makes them feel to be capable. And you can build on that for then the things they maybe don't love to do. But you never know, like it's crazy what some kids like to do. They like to vacuum, they like to scrub the bathtub because it's satisfying to get the grit out. I mean, different kids are different, but you won't know unless you try. And uh, when it comes to kids, I mean, you followed a number of different families. Is there a story that kind of stood out that you kind of want to share and think, this is what a lot of parents can relate to. Um, oh gosh, there's so many. Okay, I do have a great slide. Let's see if I can find it. Come back to these. Okay, this. So this is a family that I followed in Vermont. Um, and this, the, these are the four-year-old twins, Scarlett and Magnolia. And you can see that Scarlett is just sobbing hysterically in her mom's lap. Because she's just been told you can't go with your brother to his soccer game. And what was so powerful for me in this, um, in this image is something that we all can relate to, right? Who, what child does not have a temper tantrum or a meltdown? They all do, right? And in that moment, the mom, Bay Jackson, is communicating something very important to her child, which is strong emotions are okay. You are not gonna melt because you're upset. I'm not gonna make it a crisis. I'm not gonna try to talk you out of it. So she's not saying to her daughter, I told you last week that you couldn't go with him. Why are you getting so upset? She's not saying, don't cry, you're okay. She's just saying, I know, you really wanted to go with Zealand to soccer and hugging her and that physical touch is so powerful in helping children self-regulate. 30 seconds after this hysterical child was captured on this photograph, she hopped down and ran out to play with her sister in the driveway. So it's so easy for us to think that it's a problem we have to solve. Our child's tantrum is something we have to get rid of instead of just helping them to acknowledge that, yeah, they're upset. People get upset. They're strong emotions and you'll be okay. And I think you have a line in your book that said, respond more with eagerness and not alarm. So is that kind of what you mean by it? By just kind of really listen and seeing what the kids are about instead of just reacting right yeah. away? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's so much of our culture of parenting is fear-based, where we worry that there's something wrong. We think my kid is doing this one bad thing, like in five years, he's gonna be living in a van down by the river. You know, he's never gonna graduate from high school. And so we catastrophize and we make it worse in our heads than it is. And our kids are so attuned to us, they pick up on it. Um, you know, so, so it's really um, our, the first thing, like doctors, right? First, do no harm. And so, I mean, as a mom, and you have three kids, uh, I mean, just going through all this, I know it's all about finding some good news in bad behavior, and bad behavior is out there. Uh, what do you think was the best, you know, top thing that you learned as a mother that personally you took away from this, like, gosh, I wish I'd known this three years ago? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I guess that I wish I had known that, that my job was really not to be in charge of everything. I mean, it kind of would be nice if I were and everyone was my puppet that I could just control, but I've learned that is not how it works. And my goal actually is to teach my children self-discipline. It's not to discipline them, it's to instill in them those social and emotional skills so that when they are tempted to do the wrong thing and nobody's looking, that they do the right thing when they are tempted to give up on a hard task, that they persevere. And those are things that 
they're never going to do because someone commanded them to or because they were scared of a punishment or, or enticed by a reward. Those are such bone deep character traits that you can only instill them the hard way, which is learning through mistakes. And um, I, I guess I also wish I had known that even though I didn't have as much control as I thought, I actually have a lot more influence because our children really do love us and want to you know, connect with us. And, and that's why actually going back to this connection idea, it's so powerful when we just focus on connecting and our relationship. And in the book, there's tons of research on the power of just our physical presence beside our children helps them to self-regulate. A touch on the arm, a hug, helps to lower the activity in the amygdala in their brain, right? Where the, the fight or flight center of our brain. Um, empathy is also powerful in this way. And I found this out when I went to Columbia University to have my parenting judged by a team of neuroscientists. So no, not everyone would do this. So this is me and my daughter, Ava, and we're hooked up with EKGs that are measuring our heart rate, our breathing, and our sweat response is also measured. And what the scientists are discovering is that even within a couple minutes of a parent and child sitting together, their heart rates start to synchronize, their breathing starts to synchronize. And the implications for us as adults dealing with children are pretty powerful. So, if you're angry and you're yelling at your kid and they did something wrong and your breathing is heavy and your voice is high and your heartbeat is up, they will probably mimic you. And if instead we can call on our zen, you know, take a deep breath, bring our heart rate back down, even if it's just a 10 second break to respond, as you said before, and not react, they have a better chance of getting out of that tantrum. And the other thing we did at the study is Ava, they put the children into an MRI machine to see how they learn about emotions from their mother versus from a stranger. And this is another really powerful piece of research that the, we communicate so much to our kids about how to respond to scary things, how to respond to new experiences. And the more that we can ourselves be self-regulated, the better they will learn to. Um, to manage their emotions, behavior, and thoughts. So I think that's one, the, one of the best advice that you can give to, to parents is, I mean, you talk about kids wanting to self-regulate. Parents, in a way, have to self-regulate, right? Like your own emotions, the way you talk to your children and that kind of thing. Right, it's sort of the, that's the really hard work of parenting. And in some ways, I feel like I didn't fully mature until probably I got married. And then I had to like really think about another person and not just act out of my own whims or express every emotion I had, I had to learn, okay, when I'm angry, what are the tools in my toolbox to manage my anger? If I'm stressed, you know, I'm not going to turn to like alcohol or food or, you know, all the other things that we, that are not healthy ways to self-regulate. I'm going to find better solutions. And so we can teach our kids the solutions. If we're getting angry, we're about to yell, we can say, I feel my heat rising in my chest. I'm gonna go for a walk with a dog until I'm calm enough to discuss this without yelling. So really how you act in the house really just kind of resonates. Right. And you know, it sounds simple, but sometimes you don't think about it because you're busy in your own lives. You're working, you're doing stuff in the house. Whatever you're doing, your emotions really reflect onto your children. Right, and it's not that we have to be perfect, right? We're all gonna lose it once in a while. We're always gonna do something that we don't want to. So that's also an opportunity to model taking responsibility for a mistake and making amends. So we can say, apologize to our kids for, you know, forgetting to pick them up after an activity or losing our temper and, and show them that when you do that, you make a plan to fix it and what make, like talk out loud about what I'm going to do next time to remember the permission slip or calm down before yelling. And talk to me a little bit about the book, because people who are going to be reading this to say, does it apply to every child, every age? Can this work with everybody out there? Yes. I mean, honestly, connection, communication, and capability building works with my spouse. You know, it works with our coworkers. It's just a, such a basic model of, of how to build a relationship. And, um, and so, yeah, I would say from kids like three or four on up, 
um, to you know whatever age, but certainly 18, it's very effective. And the more that child, the older children are, the more they're going to have a larger voice in that communication piece when you're deciding the family agreements, when you're figuring out a negotiation. Three or four-year-olds may possibly, if they're mature enough, get a choice between two options, right? But a 15-year-old will be able to maybe start from a blank brainstorming screen. Um, anything else about this book that you think would be surprising when people read this? It's like, okay, I've never heard something like this before. And as a journalist, we come out, you know, we, we hear things all the time. That's pretty surprising. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it really is surprising to me that as parents, we can change the neural connections in our child's brain by the way that we interact with them. And, and that's a big responsibility. So for me, I think it's important to know that the choices we're making with our kids are really powerful. Um, there's some research in the book on the impact of parental criticism and how children who are raised in a highly critical or hostile environment are much more likely to relapse into um, mental illness, eating disorders, um, schizophrenia, than, than people who are raised in, who, who don't have that kind of critical um, parent. So, it, you know, obviously, critical feedback is how everyone learns, so there's some of that in every house, but that really helps me to try to find a way to connect with my kids before I jump into whatever correction I want to make. And I think it's this natural impulse, at least for me as a mom, from the time I had babies, you look at them and you're like, oh, there's a smudge there, I'm gonna fix it, right? We're always looking for the problem that we wanna solve and that can be, have a very negative impact on our kids. So if instead we focus on their growth and the opportunity and the possibility, you know, we can slip in corrections along the way, but that shouldn't be the biggest focus of our parenting. And, you know, obviously it always sounds easier said than done, right, when it comes to disciplining kids. But you said there's good news here, that there are tools that parents can use that they can find in this book. And it takes practice, like everything. It, it takes consistency, right, when it comes to doing something like right, this. Right, absolutely. I mean, I, I, one of my favorite little easy ones that you can use tonight or tomorrow morning, depending on whether your kids are awake when they get home, is the mumble and walk away technique which I need to trademark because it's super catchy, um, which is when you are trying to change your behavior, as you say, it's really hard, so you may catch yourself in a moment about to punish or plead and offer a reward, and you're thinking, I know I'm not supposed to punish or reward because that journalist told me not to, but I do not know what to do instead. So you Pretend you heard something and in the other room, like your phone was buzzing, and you're like, oh, I gotta get this, and just leave. Buy yourself 30 seconds or five minutes to figure out what you wanna do. Or, you know, pretend that you left something on the stove. It just gives you that minute to calm yourself, to self regulate, and to choose a different path. So that's like one of my easiest ways to get into this. Well, before we take questions from the audience, anything you want to put out there? Well, let's see what else I had. Um, <laughs> so this is one of the, either you'll love this or it will strike fear into your heart. So this is a parent educator. One of the four discipline models that I looked at was duct tape parenting, and, which does not, it duct, does, tape. duct tape, it does not involve taping your children to anything. It's that when you start to have that impulse to interfere or direct or correct or criticize, you imagine a piece of duct tape across your mouth and instead let the child learn from the experience. So she tells parents who come to her parenting classes that they have to give up all their old habits cold turkey. So no punishment, rewards, directing, nagging, pleading, threatening, all of our favorite tools, right? Instead, all they can do is notice what their kids are doing, appreciate their actions, and you know, describe the situation, so give information. I see a backpack in the middle of the front hall. Shoes, shoes, shoes. And it's terrifying, so parents are like, they go white, they're like, oh my gosh, no one will get out of bed. They're, they're not going to school, there will be no bathing. And yeah, maybe that week will be rocky, but you will learn. 
what your child can do and will do without you nagging or threatening. And that sort of resets. It's like a, a detox where you can then say, okay, we're building from here. So that's a really cool strategy. Um, strong emotions are okay. Oh, this family was just adorable. So th this is the seven-year-old Zeeland independently doing his homework at the kitchen island. So annoying. And um, while he's, his mom's talking to his sister, this is before she had the meltdown. And they also do a ton of chores. So the kids, here you see Scarlet, um, or is that Magnolia, um, chopping walnuts with a giant kitchen knife. And she's four. She's four. And she's learned from her mom how to be safe with a knife. She takes so much pride in fixing herself her own snack. And her mom's there as a resource if she needs her. But she's not saying anything. She's just watching. So these four-year-old twins fold laundry. They help with the pets. They pack their own lunches. I mean, this is the most capable family that I came across in all my research. And it just set such a high bar that I'm like, OK, I have to get my 9 and 11-year-olds to do a little more around the house. Um, so that's really it. Yeah, this is basically what we've covered today. That ultimately, I think the most important change we can make is to think about bad behavior differently and to stop seeing it as a problem and instead try to see it as an opportunity. Because even if it's a really big problem now, at, at this point in your child's life, it will be worse in five years. So solve it now. It's good. It's good that it's this red flag causing you to pay attention to it because it's better to find a solution when your child is 7 or 12 or 15 than when they're 35 and living in your basement. Right. We'll catch them early. So um, any parent wants to come up, and do they come up here to the microphone? And uh, while they're yeah. we're getting questions, I also have a newsletter, an email newsletter, that I'd be happy to have anyone join. So I'll just, um, maybe, a team, team, if you wouldn't right. mind passing it around, um, just start, if anyone would like to receive it. It's usually a monthly newsletter on, like, what I've been writing, um, parenting tips and ideas, books I like, and, um, and generally it comes out once a month. Um, anybody have questions for Catherine? Any concerns about your children you want her to address? It's always more fun to troubleshoot other people's parenting issues than my own. So please follow me on all the social medias and uh, follow Petrania also. Thank you. What is your name? So, uh, Joe. Joe. So my question has to do with what do you think about the size of the families? From when I was growing up, there were just so many kids that parents really had no time to even... I think I spent more time probably in a month with my kid than my parents probably spent in a lifetime. So it just seems like there's the family, you have three, which is kind of a big family now, right, but right. with one and two kids, um, it just seems like there's just so much attention that these kids get today. Oh yeah, absolutely. So th I love that question. I think there's two things going on with smaller families. One is that um, kids learn from other kids so powerfully. And if you have a family of four or five, you're going to learn social cooperation. You're going to learn negotiation, right, from, just from working out problems with your siblings and playing in the backyard, maybe with their friends. And you're all slightly different ages. So the older kids learn to be mentors and look out for the younger kids. The younger kids have a role model. Um, it, it's so many societies have that um, kind of dynamic. And also parents didn't have as much time to obsess over like the perfection of each individual child. They, there was a little more benign neglect. And, um, and now we, we know with smaller families, we really do have so much more pressure on like that one. And, and it, some of it is good. I mean, kids thrive on connection with their parents, but we also can drive ourselves a little crazy so um, if you look at the studies on parental time, dads especially, I think time with, uh, it's in my book, so I, forgive me if I quote the statistic wrong, but I believe that dad's time with their kids has tripled in the last 30 years. So it's just really, uh, it's wonderful, but it also, we need to help keep it in perspective. So what's your concern, Joe, more like if, if there are more kids, there's not as much time to really concentrate these tools on each one of them? Well, no, no, more from kind of what you were getting at that, um, if you only have one kid, I've, from my observation, that becomes the center of the family. But when there were a lot of kids, 
the family was the center of the family. Right. And it just seems that it's a, uh, seems unfortunate now, but with the one child, it just, uh, we all want our kids to succeed. And yeah. so kind of what Is you it important doing. to have maybe if they have fewer children to have more of a community? And that's why you said that more of them, thank you, Joe. And that's why more of them, they should be out doing more stuff outside the home to create that kind of community they may not have with more siblings yeah. around the house. I mean, I certainly don't think there's anything wrong with having an only child or two kids. Like people thrive in many different family structures, but um, you know, whenever your situation is, you need to be mindful of how you might want to supplement. So if you have, uh, and I'm sure parents of only children do this anyway, because it gives you a break. It's like finding playmates for your friends and grouping with other families where you have more social interaction. Um, but yeah, it's, it's interesting how, how our societies change. And I think in other ways, like the family, the, the children are more the focus, um, you know. So whatever we can do as parents to have our own interests, have our own priorities, um, have date night with our partner, you know, those are all things that send our kids the message that um, that they are not the they're not the only thing that's important, and that can actually relieve some pressure too, because then you know their success or failure isn't so high stakes. Hi, Hello. my name is Stacy. Um, in your research, did you find any cultures or other countries that do it well? Oh, that's such a good question. Okay, I have a little pet peeve with the like French moms are like the best and Danish parents have it all figured out because I live here. And when you look at the cross-cultural research, kids who are raised in one society expect the general parenting that they get. So for example, uh, corporal punishment is typically associated with very, very bad outcomes for kids, right? It leads to a lot of mental illness, it lead, can lead to alcoholism, uh, relationship problems, it's something we do not wanna do. However, in societies where corporal punishment is the norm, kids have fewer of those bad outcomes because it's part of how everyone's parented. And they don't look around them and say, okay, I'm the only one getting spanked, I must be a really bad kid. So by the same token, if we try to import French parenting and say, okay, in Seattle, I will be the only parent who expects my child never to eat a chicken nugget, right? that is not going to work. So, so I think it's great to look around for inspiration and to see what practices we can incorporate, but I also think that's like a, a path for making ourselves just feel bad that we are the way they are, we are. I think we need to develop our own brand of, you know, Seattle, Washington parenting that works now with the, you know, for instance, social media. We, we have social media. It's not going away. So we need to figure out how do we incorporate it into a healthy lifestyle for our families. Hi, I'm Claire. I went to high school with Ka Ka Khaki, <laughs> Catherine. Khaki's so. fine. Um, okay, I have so many questions, but um, I think the one I want to ask is about chores. Um, and I don't want to make it all about me, but um, I, my kids are master negotiators. Uh, incredible from, I, you know, it's like if there's a parenting success, I have made them inc <laughs> know that their voice matters and I feel great about that. And it's been very intentional because it came from one of those huge families where it was like, whoosh. however, now um, when I try and, and put them in the context of chores and doing something, you know, for the family and for others, they negotiate right out of everything or they simply say no. Or I yes, I want to learn how to make that. No, I changed my mind. Yeah. Or you know, so I'm. Uh, I feel like I need to kind of move and be a little bit more bounded or authoritative. Tarian, I don't know. But ha what what do you do when when the kids really don't respond to the what do you want to do? Right. Like right. nothing. Right. Right. So um, I do think it can help to start with a reset. And feel free to use tonight as your reset button and go home and say, I apologize. I have been handling this family all wrong and, and I've been giving you guys the impression that 
there are no limits and that everything is up for debate. So from now on, and then, you know, what you're going to do from now on. Right. So for negotiation, it may be, you know, I'm happy to have discussion once a day or once a week about the schedule or the activities or what we're doing, but it's just too hard for our family to have everything debated. So what do you think would work for you? Could, could we have like a Sunday afternoon family meeting where we discuss the activities and, you know, would that work for you? And so then you sort of get buy-in for a change. Um, with chores, I think it's also good to say, you know what, I do not want you guys to be incapable when you graduate and, and from high school and go off into the world. I don't want you to be one of those kids who goes to college and can't do their own laundry. So these are the things you should learn. And I, you can feel free to take the list in the back of my book. The, so which of these... I, used, I say to the research has shown. Yes, so I the research has shown. Um, it's feel, fact. It's fact. <laughs> And, um, and actually, sometimes when it's written in a book, yeah, they yeah. actually do feel that it's more authoritative. So um, which of these would you like to, to try and make a, a date to do it and a date and a time? And um, for many kids, later is always the choice. So, you know, when you get to that date, you know, they may say no and say, well, I'm disappointed because we agreed to it. So I will be in the kitchen explaining to the blank air how to cook. And if you would like to join me, I would love it. And that weight of your expectation where you just move on to what was planned, they may be a little embarrassed. They may not. You never right, know unless you try. And so if try. they don't come in that case. The adult what? If they don't come. You say, I'm going to go right. explain if they how don't to make come, it. You just, you just carry on and yeah, make it. And you try, yeah, it, just, try it the next time. Right. Try it next time. And, you know, you sort of have to experiment a little bit to see what works with your kids. Yeah. But, um, you know, if what you're doing isn't working... What have you got to lose? Right. Yeah, um, and you know, <laughs> and I think it's fair to say to kids, look, all these things have to happen in our house. Right. You're old enough now to contribute, and and we genuinely need help. So, of the ten tasks that happen, you know, dishes and cleaning and cooking, and I mean, a lot happens in a house. Right. Which would you like to start with? Because I can't do it all anymore. Right. Great. Let me know how it goes. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Mary Lou, and I'm not a parent, but I'm a teacher. Oh, okay. I work with three to six-year-olds um, in progressive Seattle. And I was just wondering what you think about um, politeness and rudeness these days. You, this is discipline, and I'm really all for this chores and everything. It's awesome. It really works. Um, but I've been really curious about it. It seems like there's maybe a connection with Lean, like not having enough limits. I was taught, so I'm pretty old, you know, about politeness. And I want children to be strong and independent and have their own thoughts, but is there something there you could say? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, this is a real challenge for a lot of us. Um, and when you're the parent, you can sort of insist, like, this is how we interact with when we're on a visit or how we greet people. and. With all of those things, you want to teach your children ahead of time and, and role play and, and pretend so that they get practice. Um, and maybe there's something going on that makes it hard for kids to be polite. So, for example, it's hard sometimes for little kids who feel shy to look right into an adult's eyes. So you could tell them, just look at the forehead. It, it actually looks like you're looking in their eyes and it doesn't feel as intimidating. In a school setting, it can be harder, but actually I would wonder if making it a game would, would help, like the good manners game. Um, we had some challenges with table manners in our house, and um, so we, we pretended we were at a fancy restaurant, and we had, you know, a tablecloth, the kids made a host stand. They wanted to take to seat our, a party as we came into the dining room. And it took like five times as long to have dinner. But they got practice using good manners, and it was fun. So in a school setting, that might be something that would work, where you could say, we're going to talk about, you know, we're going to pretend we're visiting with someone, like, you know, someone that they'd be so excited and use their best behavior, you know. Um, 
the queen or the princess, you know, the princess uh, Megan or whatever, you know, um, and, and that would spark their imagination. And that's one of the big findings in my book is that play and games are so powerful for kids. So whenever we can harness it, it's good. And the last thing I'll say about rudeness is, you know, and I'm sure this isn't the case in, in your, in your I really am sure it's not the case in your situation, but sometimes adults expect kids to do things they don't do themselves. So expect kids to speak respectfully when they're like, you did not blah, 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 or I need you to sit down. So that's not really reciprocal. You, want to, you have to give the respect to get it. And um, so I think that's sometimes what I see when adults are complaining about respect is that they're not actually modeling it. Um, and, okay, I guess this is the last thing I'll say about respect. So the other thing is that sometimes with kids in your home, especially tweens or teenagers, is they are just sassy. And you can simply respond by saying, ouch, that hurts. You know, it's, it's simple, it's not a lecture, but it isn't just letting it slide, you know, sort of accepting that's how we talk in this family. So you always have to kind of be aware of what they're doing and reciprocate in a way that's respectful and how they, you want them to react to I you I think back. so. And just, I think it's just being conscious, right, yeah. of your action. I mean, I think this goes for everybody. I mean, we can learn with, with or without kids. It's like how you react to other people, whether it be adults or kids, is um, just always have to be aware of how your action comes out. Right. So. Yeah, and you know, you, it really is interesting how, how much our kids are influenced by us and see, you know, I've had the experience of breaking down into tears in front of my kids, and that stops them in their tracks. You know, they, they are not used to that, and so that, that really shows them, oh, okay, that's, that's a limit. My mom has limits. Um, and I'm not suggesting that as a strategy, but we don't have to try to be perfect. We don't have to always be in control. We can show them what happens in the real world when they behave that way. So another challenge we've had um, is, like, not bathing, and this is really aggravating. And in those situations, you can also sort of show them, well, when you don't bathe, people may not want to sit that close to you. So and when you decide to take your bath at night, I'd love to cuddle you before bed. But for now, I notice you haven't bathed. I'll be sitting over here, right? And that way, the child has a choice. They can cuddle with their mom after they've bathed, or they can have a book read to them you know, from outside of smelling distance. So my kid doesn't do what I tell him to do, so. Um, you came to the right talk. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the central question of the book. So one thing I wanted to bring up, well, the bath was actually a good idea. That was one thing. But he'll, um, he'll refuse to get in the car sometimes. Well, pretty much every morning uh, he'll refuse to get in the car <laughs> Um, to go to school, um, and then sometimes um, when I pick him up from school, he won't want to get in the car. He kind of kind of runs around the parking lot, and so I've either done the uh, the reward thing or the punishment thing, or sometimes if I'm operating at a high parenting efficiency, I'll I'll uh, incorporate uh, getting into the car into the play. Like sometimes I can think of something creative, like Optimus Prime has a mission for you to get in the car. But that, that, that doesn't work every time. So I'm just kind of wondering, uh, using uh, kind of your methodology, what do you suggest for uh, getting them into the car or whatever it is? Just like, yeah. we need to go now and this needs to happen. Can you please do yeah. this now? Yeah, so. yeah. So it sounds like your only issues are like morning time, end of the day, and then bedtime. So just all the things through, stops through the day. Yeah, yeah, getting in the car yeah. in the morning, in the afternoon, and then refusing to get in the bath right. in the evening. Yeah, so how old is he? Uh, three years, eight months. Okay. So, yeah, so that seems kind of typical, unfortunately. Um, with a kid like that age, power may work. So I wonder if you tried having him be in charge of something in the car. Like, would you like to carry the keys to the car? Um, would you like to choose the music? Would you like to be the seatbelt captain who we will not move the car until you say we go because everyone's buckled? Um, that might help. Um, running around at pickup is hard. I mean, 
Um, I, th I find that transition at the end of the day, the kids sometimes are just, you know, melted down. So that might be a case where you say to him, you have a conversation, you know, hey buddy, when I come to pick you up, it's been frustrating to me because it seems like you're running around and running around and I can't get you in the car. What's going on for you when that happens? And what do you think might help? And you never know what he'll say. He might actually say, I'm just so excited to see you that I can't, you know, I, I can't contain it. He might say, oh, I really, I really don't like to leave my friends. And, and so I'm hoping maybe I can just stay a little longer. He may not say anything because he is only three and a half years old. Yeah, he usually doesn't stop long enough to talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you may say, I, I have to get you home and I'm willing to go with you to the car or if you aren't coming willingly, I'm going to need to pick you up. So is there a way that I can signal to you that it's time to get in the car or I will pick you up so that you're not taken by surprise when I grab you and put you in the car? And then you may just need to do it. You know, you've warned him in advance. Um, you've given him a choice. And if you do that enough times, he will have to go along with it. Um, so we have, all, we have tried. The, the, another strategy I love is acting as if. So continuing through the required activity as if your child will cooperate, even though they've never done it any time before in their life. So, which can be powerful for some kids. They, they're like, oh my gosh, my dad left. I'm supposed to be in the car. I'm going. And then other kids, like my um, ch child Ava, will stay at a Super Bowl party for an hour after you leave because she really was having fun. She is not concerned that you've left. And, um, and then it's really embarrassing, and thankfully my friend Amy still talks to me, because she's, she's like, could you please pick up your child? Because we'd all like to go to bed. So again, I would say experiment a little bit to see what works with him. Pick one area at a time to work on, so you're not trying to solve them all at once. And um, you know, it, 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 maybe you have a kid who has trouble with transition, so he may need a little extra time to like wind down or to get ready for that next step. And sometimes you just have to give it to them, but it's probably gonna get easier as he gets older. Um, and then I was thinking of something else with the morning. Morning is when it would probably be easier to say, hey bud, we're ready to go, I'll be in the car when you're ready. And after you walk out, kids feel that pull of like what they're supposed to do. You may find that after five or 10 minutes, he walks out too. So instead of arguing or yelling about it, just acting as if can be very powerful. Thank you. Feel free to email me and let me know how it goes. <laughs> I'm going to ask a question. I actually wish I could pass the mic. I'm, I'm not going to do this, but I wish I could pass the mic around. Do you have any tips for adults to self-regulate <laughs> our use of yes. technology? And just as some context, I mean, our kids are growing up. And I think there's even been like a 2020 segment on this about how technology is changing the way children are growing up in society. but. I knew my daughter, and I think everyone here who has really young children can identify, my daughter's six, knew that a cell phone was very important before she could really talk because, you know, we pay a lot of attention to it whenever it buzzes or vibrates. Our attention immediately goes to it, and we're always on it. And, um, and that continues. And I have this self-awareness that sometimes it breaks up our conversation or something like that. If, so that is probably one step in the right direction. But what tips would you give to your fellow humans, adult <laughs> humans, about how we can improve on oh. our use of technology so it doesn't affect our kids? Yeah, well, first of all, I agree with you. The fact that you're asking the question is the first step. So, um, and it sounds like you may have a little guilt around it, yeah. that you're like, <laughs> I'm ruining my children. So. I would just lose that guilt, right? Mm -hmm. Every step you make in the right direction is gonna be a positive change. So start with something that you're gonna make sacred, like 5.30 to 7, or whatever, you know, some block of time when you can really say, I'm gonna put my phone away, and I will not touch it. Mm 
and then you know see how it goes. And maybe that's too long. Maybe it needs to be 20 minutes, right? I was, I was talking about another strategy in the book called Special Time with a friend where you have 10 or 20 minutes with a young child where you're just focused on them, you're connecting on an activity they love, and you put your phone away, and she's like, 10 minutes without checking my phone? I cannot do that. So she would need to start with five, right? But even if you can, you know, start small and then build, um, that's, it's improvement. Um, so I would meditation. Also, meditation. at a time. I have a whole <laughs> chapter on how I failed to meditate. I like, I like, have been trying to learn to meditate for 20 years. And I like, I can't, I can't, and I always just fall asleep or, I, you know, <laughs> get bored. And then I learn, oh, that's how you start, right? So, um, yeah, meditation um, is self-regulation. Exercise, um, even just simple breathing is, you know, box breathing where you breathe in for four counts, hold it for four counts, exhale for four counts, and then start over again. It's very powerful. Um, calling a friend. And what's really helped me is to surround myself with people who are going to be supportive. And I've tried to learn, like, these are the friends. When I talk to them, I just start to get itchy and, like, feel bad about myself and worry if I should have enrolled my kids in Kumon at three, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> I need to stop talking to those friends as much. And, um, and, and as you make some of those changes, it can be freeing because you realize, oh, yeah, I feel better. Um, so I would just start small, you know, be aware, keep a record so you see your own growth. Mm -hmm. Because that's what, that's what encourages us to change. The last two chapters of the book are about behavior change because there's so many amazing books about how to parent, right? They tell you what to do. And I wanted with this book to tell you why the research, what to do, all of the models I looked at, and how, which is behavior change. And it's very challenging, but it, it's about social support, it's about incremental progress, and it's about tracking your growth so that you can see that you're actually moving in the direction you want to head. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Good luck. Let me know how it goes. You're getting a good mix of moms and dads. Yeah. That's really good. Hi. I'm Doug. Um, I'm the parent of two adult children, and I could probably be a case study in what not to do. Um, started out right. And then about the time they hit tweens, it all kind of melted down. And so now the family is dissolved. My kids don't talk to me. Do you have any advice for trying to reforge that connection? Oh, thank you That's so That's what much. I'm trying to get to. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's got to be so painful. So um, do they, they don't respond to letters or emails or texts? I've sent them uh, birthday gifts, Christmas yeah. gifts, emails, a yeah. couple of texts, and they've just stopped responding. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I can say is to keep reaching out, you know? And do you know why? Like, do they blame you for something? Like, and you don't need to share it. But if there's, if you know, like, there's some idea they have, even if you don't believe it's true, you know, to acknowledge that might be also a step to building that bridge. The best I can say is I tried to instill some responsibility in them, teach them how to take care of themselves, and they didn't want to learn that. They wanted to just have everything in play, and, yeah. and we didn't connect. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I really feel for you. I, I think just keep reaching out. Um, if there are people that are close to them that you might enlist as an ally, to um, help you figure out what's going on or what their thinking is. Um, I, you know, it may be that it takes them becoming parents to value the relationship. You know, I think there's this natural period of time in young adulthood when, they, you know, kids don't really need their parents anymore, and then that transition to parenthood can often be the trigger that makes you realize, oh my gosh, this love is so powerful. I took my dad for granted, or I, I suddenly realized how painful it must be for him to not be connected. So I would just keep reaching out and hope that it changes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And by the way, thank you for your book. I do wish it had been written 25 years ago. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Are, Thanks. are you going to make a sequel? I'm sorry? Are you going to write a sequel? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Um, 
So if I'm listening to this, I, <clears throat> I can't help but thinking of uh, Marshall Rosenberg and uh, nonviolent communication. And um, like a lot of these things that you're talking about, um, do seem to be using those techniques, you know? And uh, like uh, what I've kind of distilled it down to is staying off of people's ego boundaries, you know? And so, you know, <clears throat> you express your feelings and you don't <coughs> demand things or say you should do this or you shouldn't do that. Um, you just, and you always like leave an opening, you know, for them to make a decision. You leave it for them, for, for it to be their choice, you know, so like, and you don't accuse them. Like if you say, I saw a pack in the hallway, you're not saying you left your pack in the hallway, right? right. So I, I'm wondering if, um, you know, that came into the picture a little bit. Yeah, no, it's so, it's such a good insight. Um, and in my, the acknowledgments in the book, I start by saying that this book builds on decades of research and writing by psychologists and communication experts and, um, and researchers and other parent, parenting writers. So there's a lot of ideas that I think have combined to inform the four models that I write about in the book. Um, and yeah, I think ultimately, it's at the heart, this acknowledgement that we really can only control ourselves as much as we would like to. Um, one of the stories in my book that I love sharing is when I went to a preschool fair with my kids and they were like four and six, you know, or maybe a little bit older, but still at the age when the bouncy house was the most exciting thing ever. And so we went to this preschool fair and we bought a little strip of 10 tickets and then they have to spend the tickets at each of the different stations. They, you know, I thought, oh, perfect. This will teach them planning and maybe a little math. They'll have to budget, you know? They'll, they'll, they'll use their self-control to not do everything they want. And sent them out into all these, you know, making bee jewelry, making, getting tattoos. And I saw them going through the room and spending all their tickets. And they had gotten down to only one ticket each left. And um, there was still the bouncy house, which cost three tickets. So I watched them across the room, like, walk over to the bouncy house. And I'm thinking, okay, great. There's going to be a meltdown in the middle of the preschool fair. I'm going to have two, so I can't just carry them out. And instead, my, um, the older one um, exchanged some words with the lady taking tickets, and they pushed off their shoes and went inside. I'm like, okay. Did not expect that. And as they came out 10 minutes later, all sweaty and flushed and happy, they walked over to me, and we got ready to go. I said, what happened? I thought you only had one ticket left. And she said to me, well, I asked the lady, would you be willing to take one ticket? And she said, yes. <laughs> so they did not so learn. So learning that reason <laughs> yes. from you. <laughs> so they did, they did not learn the lesson I planned, right? They did not learn about math or budgeting or self-restraint, but they learned self-advocacy right? Negotiation. And ultimately, that will serve them just as well in life because who can be perfectly prepared for every eventuality, right? You can't always plan effectively for everything, but communication skills and flexibility will, will be very valuable for them. And the yeah. good news is we all can learn something from this, not, you know, as parents and as children too. So I think that's the bottom line of this book. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for coming. Yeah.